you doing? All right. It's been a really cool day so far. So thank you very much for sticking around for my bit. Mark's bit afterwards is going to also be really good. So make sure we stick around for, for that as well. That's right, mate. Um, yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, how, how some of the big brands are making their websites win. Uh, websites that win is kind of, an, I guess, a bit of an interesting concept because we would all like to assume that all of our websites win all the time. Um, I'm in Space Between, by the way, and uh, while working at Space Between, I've worked with some of these different brands that are here. And my role at Space Between is I'm a conversion and user research specialist. So I spend my time understanding what people think when they're doing things, how can I make it better, and how can I get them to, to what we call a conversion. Just quickly, a bit of a terminology. Does anyone know what a conversion might be on your website? So a conversion is literally whatever it is that you want someone to do. If you sell uh, socks, a conversion is someone buying socks. If you're an agency, it might be somebody picking up the phone and giving you a call. If you shit your pants, I don't know. But, <laughs> oh, sorry, oh. So, so I, spend, I spend all of my time. Don't call me. <laughs> I spend all of my time working out how people, how people uh, navigate their way through websites and then how to make that better. Uh, I guess, why, why is it important for us to worry about these conversions? I mean, apart from the fact that it's the primary goal of what we want everybody to do that are on our websites. Uh, and I mean, you could, you, I, I talk about this quite a lot, if that means anything, probably not much. Other people, that's, that's a better one, other people talk about this thing as well, and it's kind of, a, 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 it's growing very, very quickly. You can see kind of success stories. So this is a, a test that we ran a little while ago, and you can see across the candidates how much they increased. Oh, that's really, really boring though. Let me tell you a story. So, I love Christmas, and I know it's weird talking about Christmas when it's finally sunny in England, but I really, really do love Christmas, and I also have a son now, which means Christmas isn't all about me much. <laughs> My son, he really, really likes trains, loves little toy trains, how cute is that? Loves his little toy trains, and uh, the, now that I'm a parent, I have to consider what I'm going to get him for Christmas, so I'm like, okay. He's obviously going to want more toy trains because what little kid that's one years old doesn't want more bloody toy trains. So what do I do? Like any normal person, I go to Google. I Google kids wooden trains and I get shown like everything. Like, oh my God, is there this many? That's not even plastic. That's plastic. That's not even wooden. There's so many, so many different options. And after I navigate my way through this, I think, oh, one of these sets is quite good. So I click on it. Oh, this looks pretty good. Yeah, this, this, I can, I can imagine my little son Louis playing with this. I think he'd really like that. And then again, though, there's like loads more different options to choose from before I eventually get to the point where I think I'm going to give one of these a go. I mean, this, this is made by Big Jigs, which are a Kent based company, and they're like way down here in this list. So the chances of being chosen amongst all these people is really low. But eventually I pick somebody, this mulberry bush, I pick these guys and I think oh, these looks a little bit, a little bit different. And then this is another one. And I can't even read the name of their logo. That's how good they are. I'm kind of looking through. And all these are the same products, slightly different prices, slightly different <coughs> things. This one's Frugo. Frugo. Frugo look interesting. I feel like I recognize the logo from somewhere, but I've never used them before. Wooden Railways. Okay, that's, that looks like a good one. They've got, they've got a good price. Then once I start navigating through the website, I'm like, oh, they don't have PayPal. And I don't really trust the brand. And I start getting this point where I'm like, who the hell? Who the hell are these people? And, and why am I going to spend my money with them? This is, this is a, a reasonable amount of money to consider the purchase of. So like any sane, rational person when making a purchase, what do you do? You go to Amazon. It's got one click payment. I barely even have to consider if I want to spend the money before I've already spent it. It's got, it's got this, it, it remembers all of my details. So again, it's even quicker for me to buy things. But I buy with them all the time. I know it's probably going to get it's probably going to turn up at some point. It might be late, but it'll eventually get there. I know that if anything does go wrong, they've got a really good customer service to talk to. But the most important part is that I get to enjoy Christmas again. It's done. I've done the thing that I want to do that's blocking me from enjoying my Christmas. And it's Jeff Bezos that says, if you do build a great experience, customers tell each other about that. And word of mouth is really, is really powerful. And I'll caveat that with as well, is if you build a really bad experience, people will equally tell people about that. I saw yesterday someone moaning about the Train Lines app. They were saying the app is amazing and this one tiny thing about this app meant that they wrote this really long post about how annoying it is. But the main thing they started with, I really enjoy the app, but that's what we're all like. We're all happy to moan about things, or at least definitely the English people in the room. I know we all like a good moan. <laughs> 
So a better conversion roadmap then. How do we kind of improve these things? How do we get our websites competing against the likes of Amazon, at least from a conversion point of view? As with anything, I can narrow it down to a very simple three-step process. So the first step is to understand your customers. Know who they are, what they do, how do they do it, what they like, what don't they like. The next step is to learn what they want. What do they want to get out of the thing they're doing on your website? I'm not a marketer, I'll be completely honest. Uh, I'm not really a developer, I don't really know where I fit within the gap, somewhere around in the middle. But, uh, but understanding what people want, if you've got the wrong type of people coming to your website, you're never gonna get them to divert. But if you've got a bunch of people coming to your website, is there something we can get them to do? And then finally, profit. Whee! And the, the profit one's a, an interesting one, because I think lots and lots of things that we all do talks about profit being, being the important, the goal of what we're looking to do. But I think nothing says it better than conversion rate, because it's much easier to double your business by doubling your conversion rate than by doubling your traffic. Any marketing, SEO, PPC people in the room? If, can I double the traffic to my website overnight? No, it's hard. You can do it, you definitely can do it. I know that there are amazing people in the room for doing it, but it does take a long, long time. And by the way, this wasn't actually Jeff Bezos, this was Jeffrey Eisenberg, but he doesn't have very nice, glorious photos like this. So <laughs> there's Jeffrey Eisenberg. Hi, Jeffrey Eisenberg. So step one, understanding your customers. What do I mean when I say understand your customers? And if you haven't learnt by now, I do like a bit of a story. So story time. Hey. hey! Has anyone been to Hythe before in Kent? Now I know a lot of people aren't from uh, the UK. Put your hands up if you're in Hythe, look around. Oh, quite a few people have actually been to Hythe, that's amazing. If you're over here for a little while, go to Hythe, it's really lovely. If you want to go to Hythe, this is Hythe. This is Hythe Beach. Um, and the reason I'm showing you Hive Beach is because it's a lovely little place. It's probably, what, 30 minutes from here? Um, it's a really, really, really lovely place. But the reason I'm showing it to you is because it's where I get my hair cut. I get my hair cut in Hive. And hopefully, some of you will resonate with this next story. So when I'm getting my hair cut, I go to the same place over and over again. I go out of town. So I drive travel for about 20 minutes to get my hair cut. I go out of town, I go to the same place, I have the same hairdresser, and every time I go there, I'm like, hey, Shaffer, how you doing? How's the family? How's your kids? Oh, my kids, they, they're great as well. Oh my God, we've got such a good connection. And we get on really, really well. And he, hey, what do you want? Shaffer, don't be silly. You know what I want. You don't need to ask me what I want because you're an angel and you'll do exactly what I want. And he cuts my hair and, and we chat in the whole way through. And at the end, he does this thing. And I, I hope this isn't just a British thing, but he kind of gets the mirror out and he shows me around. What do you think? And I'm like, You've done it again, you're an angel. And I, I tip him and I, so I pay him more than he needs to be paid and then I, I leave and he's really happy. And as I get outside, I get my phone out and I call my wife. And I go, hey, how you doing? And she goes, yeah, I'm good, thanks. Goes, yeah, very good. How's the haircut go? He's fucked it up again, hasn't he? He's absolutely ruined it. Like you, you, you can all see my hair. You can see what he's done. It's all on level and it's ruined. But the, the moral of this story is that we're all very polite. Even in these sorts of situations, we're all quite polite. And we're always, quite, we're always reluctant to upset people and to tell people kind of the honest truth in these situations. Now, I will caveat it with my hairdresser is fantastic, by the way, and you definitely should go see him. This is my son getting his hair cut. That's how much I like my hairdresser. And actually, this is me. Look, I'm there in the background getting my hair cut with him. That was like a few days ago. So go there, he's really great. But it helps me tell my story. And, Harry Selfridge once said, the customer is always right. And I will caveat with that with, but they will lie to you. And they will, they 100% will. They don't mean to, but they will, because that's what people do. So the first stage is understanding our customers. Who are the people that are buying from our websites? Who are the people that are buying our products or are not buying our products? And we want to start categorizing them. We want to start understanding, okay, are we dealing with um, 18 to 25 year old, mixed gender, doesn't matter where they are in the world, or are we dealing with 35 plus, they have to be in this specific point in the UK, uh, they need to be in this specific household income range. And we just need to start understanding what that is. If we're, uh, if we're top shop, there's no point speaking to the same people who buy from top man, for instance. We want to make sure that we're getting the right demographics in at the right time. And we want to learn what they want. We want to be able to talk to these people. I find the best way to do this personally is to actually talk to people. It's a crazy idea. But I actually like to get people in, get, our, get real customers in and sit them down and have a conversation with them and understand what it is they want. But I will give you some tips because talking to people, as I've just proved, they will, they will lie and they don't mean to. So what you want to do is you want to start getting some good information out of them. 
thank you. And the, the, there are a few ways to do that. Firstly, don't tell them what company you are from. Or if you're doing this as an agency, don't tell them what company you're doing this on behalf of. Just talk to them, have a chat with them. Talk to them about multiple brands. Even better, talk to them about your competitors as well as your own brand. If you're Topshop, talk to them about, I don't know, other Topshop type brands. Dorothy Perkins, I don't know, whoever else there is, and not in the Arcadia group. Talk to them about, talk to them about ASOS, talk to them about uh, New Look, talk to them about Zara. Because the best part of that is, if they don't know who you are, they're less likely to lie to you. They're more likely to start telling you home truths. Also as well, don't lead them. If I say to you, what do you think about this photo? I think it looks rubbish. Straight away, I'm starting to influence your decision and you're probably more likely to say to me like, yeah, Luke, that is an awful stock photo actually. You definitely shouldn't put that in your slide deck. And I'm thinking, oh God, I shouldn't have put that in my slide deck. But <laughs> you, wanna, you, wanna, you want people to be open and honest. So we wanna be able to talk them through a very neutral, relaxed conversation. I could talk about this for a little bit longer, but I'm pretty sure I'm running slowly out of time. So, uh, but, but basically the main thing of this is when you're talking to people, try not to guide them and try not to let them know who you're talking to them from. And out of that, we wanna learn what they want. We also wanna learn what they do. And how can you learn what people do through websites other than talking about them, but we've, we've done that bit now. So it's Google Analytics. Anyone used this before? Google Analytics, quite a powerful tool. Um, it's a really, really good tool, and if you really like your data, like, like me, I'm a bit of a data nerd, maybe that's the camp that I sit in. You can spend a lot of time looking through this, lots and lots of different kind of specs and data to look into. A tool I really like, and it's a, there's a free part to this tool, is a tool called Full Story. So Full Story, and some people, and if you've not seen tools like this before, it might be a bit weird, the amount of information that we do, we are able to collect. Full Story allows you to record kind of real actual sessions of customers. So this is one of, our, one of our, the companies that we work with. You can see the, company, the person's actually typing things in here. They're clicking on different areas. You can see the whole walkthrough of what it is that they're doing, what they've clicked on. It gives you extra reports around um, uh, rage quits. This, the rage clicks, sorry, they give you, which effectively it is a thing that people actually do. If you get really annoyed with something, you just kind of smash the mouse and shake it around loads. But it helps you kind of understand what it is that people are doing. And by using these sorts of tools, we can then start to see the frustrations. And all of this process we're starting to do, we're starting to say, okay, where are our competitors doing better than us? And what can we learn from them? And where are, our, where are we not doing so well? And where can we, where can we improve ourselves? And that leads us all the way to the nice part. Profit, whee! Now, I'm, I'm a weird conversion rate optimization person. This for me is never the goal. I mean, I like it, it's nice, but it's never the goal. For me, the goal that I'm always looking to do is to please the customer. And I promise you, I really, really do promise you, if this is the thing that you focus on over that bottom line dollar, it'll make you money. It'll make your clients successful, it'll make your stores successful. But how do we validate these ideas now? So we've got these ideas from our user research and from looking through Google Analytics and through Full Story. We get ourselves into a bit of a cycle. That's really good, a nice cycle. We're starting with this analyze section, we're moving into research, we're then coming up with some ideas, we're designing some new ideas. And then we wanna kind of test it and measure it. So how do we do that? We use a te technique called uh, converge rate optimization and through that we're doing A-B testing or multivariant testing. Has anyone heard the idea of A-B testing before? Put your hands up if you have. Cool, a few people in the room. So for the people that haven't, the idea of A-B testing is we've got, this is our current website. This is our, what our website looks like today. We've got a big image and some other little images or something, use your imagination. And then we've got another idea from our research that said actually, if those images, that image was a bit smaller and these ones had a bit more room, that might be better in the end for our, for our customers. So we've got these two ideas. And what we do is we put all of our customers through that. We put 50% through one, we put 50% through the other. And at the end of that, we then get some metrics. So we see actually on this one, 35% of people picked up the phone and called us compared to only 11% of people on this side. So what this is, is it's a statistical probability that we end up with of is this a better idea or not, rather than just putting it in, looking week on week and going, oh, it looks about good. We get to actually see on our real customers and we can run this for as long as we want. How does that interact? How does that react? What happens? What's the outcome of that? And this is something that brands do all the time. It's constantly, constantly iterating. How many times have you gone to Facebook or Twitter or any of the big social media platforms and you've seen something slightly different to your friends? Like, everyone done that? How many times have you seen something and then you, it's gone? You've never seen it again. That's a failed test. 
It's something that they've tried and it didn't work, so they took it out. But the downsides of not doing this are huge. Snap. Anyone Snapchat? I don't Snapchat. I'm apparently quite weird, but I'm so glad that none of you lot do either. So Snapchat for a while, they had this, they were doing really, really well. And what happened after a little while, they released a brand new variation of their app and their shares just tanked, like really, really tanked. I mean, one of the Kardashian girls also said it wasn't very good, which apparently is a really bad thing. I don't know. But, but, but it was all based on the fact that they released this new design and everyone hated it. Everyone really, really hated it. So much that they were posting things online about it. They were deleting it. They were complaining about it. And this is a really normal thing because I guarantee every time that Facebook or any of these platforms update their user interface, you look at it and you think, oh, I definitely preferred it the old way. That was rubbish. I preferred it how it was before. We, we, we do not like change as people. So if we could do this slower, if we can test the changes as we go, we're much more likely to be successful. And I want to try to theorize this because I like to think I have really good ideas. And quite often I test my ideas and they don't work and it makes me sad. So I want to see how this is. This is a recruitment website. Um, this is a recruitment website they're nationwide in the UK. And you can't quite see because of the pixelation here. But these images are exactly the same, apart from one difference. On the button here, this one says read details and apply. OK. And on the button down here, this one says apply for job. Put your hand up if you think that read details and apply converted more users. Skeptical people in the room. And put your hands up if apply for job got more users. Confident, courageous people in the room. You're all wrong. You skeptical people, you've got it. Go on, give yourself a pound on the back, skeptical people. And, uh, uh, but, but at the same time, it's a, it's a very rational understanding. It's the reason I can put it up here because I'm confident that you'll all make that same decision. Apply for job sounds like a very direct action, right? Apply for job. Oh, Oh, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to apply for a job. Therefore, I should click the button that says apply for a job. Read details and apply. I want to apply for a job. That's well long. But applying for a job is a big thing, right? You change your job probably three times a year. You work in a company that has a four-day week. You probably don't ever... Three times a year, so <laughs> once every three years. If you work in a company that has a four-day week, you probably never change your job. You too. But, uh, but you know, it, it's a big thing. We don't, it's not a decision we make lightly. Although Mark probably wishes we did. Uh, <laughs> The, the, the research that we did around this was actually that if we were to say to somebody, here's some information about this job, you've got a small snippet of text and a little bit of information on the salary, click this button and find out some more about this job. And if you like it, apply for it. That's effectively what that second button is saying. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was changing job, I wouldn't be able to make my decision up on a sentence. So this is the benefit for it. And in terms of running these tests, there are lots and lots and lots of different tools. Um, VWO is one that's relatively cheap. Optimizely is one that's very, relatively expensive. Um, they have different features and functionality. Uh, so there'll be different ones that will work for your business. There's Google Optimize, though it's completely free on the free tier of Google, as Google like to do their 360 expensiveness. Um, but but have, a look at, have a look at a tool that would work best for you. And realistically, what we come to at the end of this is that profit is just the best test. It's the best thing for the user. It's the best solution for the website. It's just the best test. I want to be able to give you something you can take away because uh, something that, that might be a bit more actionable today on your websites. So a couple of examples of common practice tests that would tend to win for a website. But I will caveat it with your users are completely different to the users I've worked on before unless you're one of the brands that were at the start of this. So make sure you test these things. Fewer form fields. How many times I've seen a contact form that's got, I don't know, telephone number on it, and I say to the company I work with, how many times do you call them or text them? And they go, oh, we don't. We just send them emails. I'm like, why are you collecting telephone number? Oh, we might want to use it next month. And if you take telephone number out, it's another piece of personal information that people are reluctant to give away. So if you're not using information, middle names at one, um, title is another that's quite often uh, on forms that we don't do anything with, take it out. Test it. I'm pretty confident it will, uh, it will increase your conversion rate. But at the same time, because everything has a counter argument, sometimes more form fields is better. Right? If you're buying uh, a house uh, online for some reason, uh, and literally you saw a house that you liked, it's a very expensive purchase or a car, you click the button to buy your car, and literally I just say to you, card number, go. <laughs> no, 
I'm spending thousands and thousands of pounds. I want to be a bit more reassured. At least we'll walk people through the process. Where's your address? Oh, good. At least I know I'm going to get my house delivered to me. At least I know I'm going to get my car delivered to me. Uh, what, what's your name? Fantastic. They know who to put on the deed for the house. I don't know. It's important that we walk people through the correct amount of steps. Likewise as well, the order of fields. If you ask for a credit card number first, it's that same thing. It's quite, that's a personal bit of information that I don't tell many people. I'm happy to tell you my name though. Let's start the conversation over there. It's like walking into a bar and just going straight up to the first person and say, hey, how much do you earn? Like, it's, not, it's not how conversations work. So the, the next one, remove gift cards. If you sell something on your website and you have a little section on the website that says, oh, sorry, better one. If you're, if you're buying something and you're on a website and you see a little section that says, add your gift card here, what's the first thing you do? Google gift cards, obviously, because if there's some other person who got £15 off my £200 purchase, I bloody well want it as well. And do you know what the most frustrating piece is? If I don't find a gift card, someone, somebody somewhere has had a gift card at some point and now I'm not getting it. And there's a psychological phrase for this, which basically defines to the fact that this, this is loss aversion. Our brains are wired in such a way that if I give you 10 pounds, and that it takes you up, say, one point in happiness, if I take away 10 pounds for you, it'll take away two points of happiness. We are much, 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 uh, much, much, much more switched away from losing something than we are from gaining something. So straight away, my brain goes into, I want whatever the last person had, and I don't even know what it was. So if you, don't, if you have a gift card field on your website and you're not really using it, obviously they're very good for promotions, but if you're not using it, take it out. Take it out until you put the next promotion in and people can actually find a gift card and enjoy the service and buy the thing. I guarantee it will increase your conversion rate. Don't guarantee, please test everything. <laughs> Only a couple more. USP bar, really good one, quite a common one now. Qu quite a lot of websites have this. Put your USPs across the top of the website. If you, do, if you ship things, shit things, uh, and you do free shipping, oh God, this is going badly, Amy. Uh, make sure that you make sure that you <laughs> make sure that you put that information at the top of the you know, top of the page. It's an important piece of information. And personalization, really, really good one. Often used quite badly as well. My bank's terrible at it. Talk to people when it makes sense to talk to people, though. Don't just say, "Hi, Luke. This is some terrible information we're going to tell you because it's terrible." But we said Luke, so you'll like it. When it's appropriate. Talk to people in a way that makes sense to them. If they've bought something from you before, talk to them about that. If, it's a, if you're going to show them a product you want them to buy, show them a product that's relevant to the thing they've bought before. If they've been in contact through your website before, talk to them about that. It, it, it's a good thing to do. I nearly finished, promise, Becky. So, <laughs> so three steps to a better conversion roadmap. One, understand your customer. Two, learn what your customers want. And three, Please, those customers. That is everything that I was hoping to say. If you're interested in learning anything more about these sorts of topics, here's some really good books, some really good things to kind of have a look at afterwards. I didn't write any of them, but uh, they are all very, very good. The next slide says questions, which we're not going to do yet. We might be doing that later, though, but I'll be around for a little while if anyone wants to have a chat. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.